episodio diferente. Hoy va a ser nuestro primer podcast en inglés. Inspiring you to wake up in the morning and, and staying disciplined and staying inspired in the process. And there's no other tool better than that. Do you feel you were more popular than other trainers because of the music you were playing? Offers me a job right there to come to Mexico and be the master trainer for this new startup. I want like an all-star team of instructors, boutique fitness. Because of the business model, because of the way it's set up, it should be like the four seasons of fitness. And from what I understand, when you were at Ciclo, your classes were booked in weeks in advance. I want to dive deep a bit more onto the training itself. And I want him to stay true to himself because I know if he can stay true to himself, his community will come. The instructor needs to take himself out of the performance aspect from time to time. But the training aspect needs to be focused and I feel like now I'm really excited about going to a sessions uh, class and, and, and testing it out. And... Vamos, 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 vamos. Vamos, estamos de vuelta. Es verdad que hay que empezar en castellano. Sí, episodio diferente. Hoy va a ser nuestro primer podcast en inglés. Sí, pedimos disculpas a los que, a los que no podáis entenderlo. Vamos a intentar ponerlo con subtítulos, pero este episodio va a ser en inglés. Es que no podíamos dejar pasar la oportunidad de tener a Jeremy aquí. Correcto. Así que vamos con ello. Jeremy, ¿estás listo? Por supuesto. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. In English, we move. All right, Jeremy, Venga. thanks a lot for, for making time to be here. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, guys. I'm super excited and uh, very happy to be here. So your story and, and how you got to, to where you are today and what you're doing with your life is uh, is quite cool, and we'll go through that for sure. But we wanted to, to get into into music itself because you describe yourself as a, mu as a mu musician at mm -hmm. heart. Um, so it'd be interesting to, to, to see how that links, in your opinion, with, with human performance and in sports uh, in general. Both Aris and I are huge uh, you know, sports fan. fanatics and music fans, mm -hmm. and we use music in our, in our daily lives to sort of get motivated to do stuff. So we wanted to get your point of view on, on how music impacts that. Uh, music is uh, totally the conductor of my life. I mean, everything uh, in my entire adult life has been centered around music. So I think it's a, a cool way of inspiring you to achieve anything, any and everything. Uh, of course, I use it in my uh, my job in uh, inspiring people during fitness. Um, I think it's a great way to, you know, bring out the best in everyone and get them really inspired and and motivated. Um, I don't know many things that can motivate people to wake up at six o'clock in the morning and, you know, sweat and other than, you know, sort of the, the idea of looking good and, yeah. but you need something in the process to really get you going, uh, and inspiring you to wake up in the morning and, and staying disciplined and staying inspired in the process. And there's no other tool better than that than music. Mm. And, uh, I, I just sort of stumbled into this. Um, I actually wanted to be a pop star <laughs> when I was a teenager. So that's what I started training for. I mean, uh, there uh, is this very famous uh, classical crossover singer in the United States called Josh Groban. And so I sort of started out wanting to be like that, singing like Andrea Bocelli pop opera music in Italian and uh, years ago. And so I studied music. I got my undergraduate degree from the University of South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And then after I got my under, undergraduate degree, I moved to New York and studied musical theater for another two years. And then I graduated and started working in musical theater, doing like Broadway shows mm -hmm. uh, and cruise ships and singing and weddings. Uh, and then from there, I went into fitness. Into fitness. Yeah. And yeah, and, and going back to the importance of music, it's actually crazy because through this podcast, we've had the chance of having, having on quite a lot of very interesting people from one of the most famous neurologists in Spain, for example, who came on and, you know, after a long conversation with her, we were like, okay, so what should we do when we have like a down moment or what, what tools can we use? And often the answer is like music, music, yeah. yeah. you know, choose your song or find something that gives you, gives you peace and, and, and use it. And then it goes from that spectrum of trying to calm yourself down to the extreme opposite, which is we also had in a very, very um, successful and good coach uh, of athletes who is uh, Carlos Sainz, uh, the, the father of Carlos Sainz, his coach. Um, and, he, and, and he was telling us the importance of music while you're doing sport and how it affects it. And then through that, we've also done a bit of research ourselves. There's a few studies that have been done um, and we, we see it in our, in our personal lives. Like when we, when we go cycling for, I don't know, you got to do a long ride. You're going down for seven hours and then mm -hmm. you're three hours in and you're like, oh, this is tough. And you know that you've saved 
turning the music on for the last three because it's it's gonna get hard and then as soon as you turn the music on it's like a new day you've yeah. got energy so it really is crazy i actually did some research and and the university of british columbia um had a research that actually proves that music obviously it increases dopamine uh, mm. so probably you know you can boost your mood if you're down or whatever but it, it actually it's linked with uh, an increase in performance because as, as Chris was saying, uh, you know, if you have to do an extra effort or in one of your of your sessions, right, um, that that be, like following a beat, uh, even having a link with the song you're listening to, if it reminds you to, I don't know, your childhood, whatever it is, it can give you that extra power of of getting it all out. Absolutely. And uh, I think maybe you can speak for yourself as well. But when when I've tried to do uh, to do a one of my like a, a top effort, a max effort, and something. I've done both, like no music and music, depending on the situation. Sometimes, you know, you just run off uh, off your batteries on your on your AirPods, right? And you're like, damn, like I'm yeah. not gonna have that extra boost. Which, yeah. <laughs> on one end, I think it's it's cool to be with yourself, but when you have that extra beat, you know, blasting on your ears, you're like, all right, now I'm in the zone. Yeah, it's crazy. for me, it's a necessity. I I at one point, uh, maybe a little over twenty or twenty years ago, I. Uh, was going through like a depression. I had just gotten out of a relationship and I put on weight. I've always been like, you know, I come from a long line of bit people. So I was overweight actually uh, most of my young life, like chubby. Oh. And so here I was in my early twenties, mid twenties and putting on weight again. And then one day I just said, you know, I'm just gonna go to the gym and start working out. And at that time, I wasn't like, you know, super into uh, fitness and health lifestyle, but I used to have this music playlist that I put together and I would go every day and run 60 minutes for that. So I would do cardio for 60 minutes and then I would go hit the weights. And that I, I still remember that playlist and that playlist, I think, changed my life and set me on the trajectory of keeping fitness in my life so it, it was all about music and so listening to you guys talk about the research i i'm totally uh evidence of that mm -hmm. that music can definitely inspire you to uh you know push that extra edge and you know for me because i'm a, a performer and aspire to entertain i'm listening to the music and you you've got that chemical something or other going on in the mind i mean i don't know how you quite describe it, but I just imagine myself performing and entertaining and you feel heroic yeah. and you just feel like you're larger than life and that you can take on anything whenever you For hear real. that song and then you hear, you feel the chill bumps yeah, and yeah, you yeah. get that, that extra <laughs> I'm even, something I'm going even down getting a spine. bit of that vibe even just <laughs> thinking about it, you know? Yeah. And it is like that. And I wish we were, we had like Andrew Huberman's mind to go science based on this and like have all the, all the chemical reactions and explained and so on. But it is true that, that any music inspires you and, and and i find it interesting that it also depends on what kind of music it is like sometimes i would i would hit for example when i'm cycling now weirdly i'm into like some rock rock uh -huh. stuff like now i really want like the the heavy metal stuff and i'm like ah oh, going aggressive on it but then when i'm at the gym i rather go for like some hip-hop or and at some points i want some techno so it really it really is like every music has its time and it really hits the spot and it helps a lot that, that's a great point every yeah. music has its time yeah I, yeah and and uh, I want to hear more about when you pivoted from uh, the music industry to fitness. So mm -hmm. where does that come from and how do you start in the, in the fitness industry? They, they actually, with the type of work that I do, they, they go hand in hand. I mean, uh, I was, uh, I just finished doing like a cruise ship job. And uh, the way my life at that time was working in New York, you know, if you're a Broadway performer, you have a gig, you have a season where you're working and it's, it's cool. And then you have a season where you're, you're looking for work and you're auditioning. So you have like a downtime. And I was looking for something that would give me stability, you know, like a day job while I was auditioning and in between gigs. And I remembered I, I answered a Craigslist ad uh, looking for a front desk uh, associate. Now, prior to that, I had been working at uh, Reebok Sports Club in Manhattan on the Upper West Side. Um, and this was Soul Cycle. I don't know if you guys have ever yeah. heard of Soul yeah. Cycle. Yeah. yeah, it's like this. It later on became like this huge phenomenon, and it really inspired the boutique fitness industry as we know it all over the world. Just sorry uh, to cut you off, but for for the listeners, uh, maybe you can brief what Soul Cycle is for everyone that doesn't know what it is. So it's a uh, boutique fitness company that that started in New York City, I think, officially in two thousand seven, two thousand eight. It was founded by these two women. Uh, Julie Rice and Elizabeth Cutler. And uh, basically they wanted to 
brings sort of a yoga like mentality to spinning. Uh, they had taken classes in LA. And so the original concept was, you know, cool music on the bikes with candles and, you know, lights underneath and making the instructor really the center of, of the class. And, uh, that's how it started. I mean, basically any, uh, spinning class, uh, with the dancing on the bike, that's, that's been inspired by, uh, soul, soul cycle, cycle mm -hmm. uh, which started maybe 15 years ago, 15, 16. Years when ago. did you, when did you join them? I joined the company in 2010. So they'd been and going for, they had years? been going for about three years. For about three years. So when I joined, there were only three locations in Manhattan and they had the Hamptons and I think one location in the suburbs of, of New York city and uh, like, uh, Scarsdale. So there were like five studios. I mean, that seems like very few when you think about how big the company is now. And, uh, but back to how I got into that, I, I was looking for a stable job and I, I started working at the front desk, you know, um, and thinking that, okay, I'll be here. And then when my next theater gig and Comes I up, leave, really yeah, I'll leave. But I was uh, invited by Julie Rice to, um, to audition to be an instructor. I had never really been a fitness instructor at that time before then. And uh, I, I worked out in the gym because, uh, you know, my job was about being physically, mm -hmm. you know, fit to a point. And I sort of took all of those elements that I had from there and I auditioned. I, I remember the day I auditioned to be an instructor. I was like, I don't want to audition because if, if I get rejected, then I'll still have to work at the front desk and I'll have to see everybody who, <laughs> who, who made it, who made it going in for the training every day. And so I was like, at the last minute, you know, I'm going to do it. And I can still remember the songs that I auditioned with. Uh, now you guys are a little younger than I am, but I don't know if you could quite remember, but this is when Katy Perry was like in her prime. Okay. So like the song teenage dream, of course, <laughs> I remember, uh, writing to a remix of teenage dream. And, uh, and an Enrique Iglesias song, yeah, yeah, yeah. actually, uh, th that was part of my audition playlist. And so I got accepted into the program and then, uh, the, the training program was about two months. And, uh, so around Thanksgiving, which, uh, is of course in November, that's what, around the time that I taught my first class. And then it just sort of rolled there. Now at the same time, I was still performing, still singing, uh, doing my gigs. At that time I started, uh. I have a very crazy life with, with music. I used to sing at a Russian restaurant, a Russian <laughs> club in uh, Brooklyn. And so I would take the train, take the Q train uh, from uh, Manhattan into Brooklyn every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So like Soul Cycle became my day job. I would teach classes during the day and then I'd sing at night. And I mean, I'm like dancing and singing. They were looking specifically for a black guy who could sing, you know, pop music that they wanted the young kids who were coming to those Russian restaurants who were sort of assimilating into American culture, but they had other performers who were there for, you know, the Russian speaking expats. It wasn't necessarily Russian immigrants from mainland Russia, but it was like this representation of all the Russian speaking countries who were living in Brooklyn at that time. You know, you're talking about Uzbekistan and Ukraine and Georgia and Ar Armenia. All of them were coming to this restaurant. And then I even learned two or three songs in Russian. No way. Uh, my Russian was terrible, but <laughs> you know, so I had to do all of that. And so I was doing both at, at the same time until uh, for four years, I, I stopped working at the Russian restaurant by year two. And then Soul Cycle became my full time job. Was it, and was it, um, when you transitioned into Soul Cycle and, and started seeing what the vibe was like, was it like love at first sight where you're like, this is amazing. Did you get on that stage and where you're like, this is it or? Uh, no, <laughs> it was, it, it was a lot of ups and downs. I mm -hmm. originally, when I got into the program, I was, I thought this was a cool fit with all of my skills. You know, I like to work out. I like to exercise and, you know, I get to be creative and, and be performing and, and, and everything. Uh, but for some reason or another, I think I, I, I got a lot in my head and I wasn't as successful as I wanted to be, mm -hmm. uh, initially. And, uh, I sort of had to figure out, you know, for me, I'm always the kind of guy who wants to please the teacher. Okay. And so my master instructor who was very, uh, she was incredible. She taught a lot of things, but I was trying to do things like her and trying to play 
this eclectic music. Mm -hmm. You know, I came from a classical music background, so I was trying to do playlists that were like rock opera and just things weird, weird, crazy stuff. That because because at Soul Cycle you were you, you had to do your own playlist as well. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The that's like the thing making your own playlist and making sure that your music is a reflection of sort of your personality. Mm -hmm. I had to figure out, you know, what my, my thing was. I mean, at the time I was, you know, I'm a young, young guy who looks like a dancer, even though I'm not a dancer, people always thought I was a dancer and they look like you're going to play hip hop. You're going to play uh -huh. dance music. And I loved that, but I, I just felt like, you know, you have to remember I'm, I'm, sort of out of my element. I mean, I was born in South Carolina in a very rural background, you know, 2000 people. And I still had a lot of that in my mentality, but suddenly I'm teaching for this, you know, high end boutique fitness company where they're charging 35, almost $40 per class. Mm -hmm. And these Other are wall time. street. Yeah. <laughs> uh, wall street guys, people in Tribeca, really high society people who go to the Hamptons on the weekends and yeah. on the summers, I was a little intimidated. <laughs> And so uh, I was thinking, okay, I need to play very eclectic music. When I started playing Kanye and Pitbull, yeah. and when I just was just true to myself, that's when I found my my biggest success. Were you playing Good Morning from Kanye? I played Good Morning. I played. No, that that would have been a hit. <laughs> yeah, that would have been a hit. If, I'm I, if you, I go to class and someone pops up Good Morning, I'm like, yes, yeah, let's go. I mean, <laughs> that, that's funny you say that because that album, uh, Graduation. I, Graduation, mm -hmm. but when I first started, uh, my uh, Twisted Fantasy okay. uh, with with Power and mm -hmm. yeah, uh, those wow. songs hits, absolute yeah, hits. That that had just come out, Yo. so like that was the album uh, that that was hot. And Rihanna, of course, was was popular at the time, and and Beyonce, Lady Gaga, Pitbull, you know, nice. like the I call them the recession hits. Yeah. <laughs> and, do, and, do you and, feel and, you you were more? more uh, sorry to cut you off, but do you feel you were more popular? than other trainers because of the music you were playing so is there an attachment from like a fidelity point of or a loyalty point of view from a client to a coach just because of the mashups that they play on the on the sessions well at that time i wasn't doing the mashups okay. you know that that came actually didn't come until madrid wow okay. i never started doing the mashups and like adding that element until i got here but to your point i think that everybody is going to gravitate to you know, there are songs that everybody plays, like at the time, um, Wild Ones or Good Feeling was pop. every instructor was playing that. But I think it's more so the connection that the instructor has with the music. And for me, I think why I was able to eventually, after a year or so, build a, a loyal and devoted uh, following client base is people were really feeling my connection with the music. You know, I actually started playing music that I forgive me for saying I, I thought of myself as like the the pop bastard child, like because everybody else was playing more, you know, underground music. And mm -hmm. I sort of was the one that that played the very poppy stuff. Uh -huh. And but I was just truly connected to it. I mean, you throw me a, a Michael Jackson song on and I just become a whole different person and I go into a whole different trance that that I think people really gravitate to i still today one of my signature songs to play is they don't care about us nice by michael jackson and you know just my connection with and i have a different version of it like i uh took two different versions and sort of meshed them together i guess if you want to call that a mashup but not really yeah uh but i've been playing that same version of that song for 12 years now and i mean even here in madrid from new york to mexico to madrid it has the same uh, and that's what i want to go into now because we have i think if we keep talking about like particular questions regarding the actual activity we'll go on forever um but i do want to sort of transition onto your next step which was getting involved with ciclo and mm -hmm. i'm quite interested in seeing knowing how that relationship started and where that came from yeah well i was in my fourth year mm -hmm. at soul cycle uh and it was it was actually quite quite random uh this young man from from mexico city uh, took my class. I didn't, I wasn't even aware that he was taking my class. And, uh, I get this message on LinkedIn. Now, I was not very active on LinkedIn, but someone uh, said, Jeremy, I took your class. Uh, I'd like to speak to you about training. And then I said, okay, sure. So we have this uh, Skype meeting and he's in Mexico city. 
And basically what he's offering me is he offers me a job right there to come to Mexico and be the master trainer for this new startup that was going to be the Mexican version of SoulCycle. And uh, I was going, I, the idea was that I would come there for a year at least to uh, train the first group of instructors in Mexico and then stay there as an instructor as well. And uh, it just so happened that he approached me with this prospect at the right time. I had mm -hmm. just gotten out of a relationship. I was, you know, feeling like I was sort of getting to a place that Soul Cycle was growing, but I hadn't felt like I was growing there mm -hmm. for a while. I, I still loved the job. I still loved uh, the company. But anyway, uh, I moved to Mexico City and, uh, you know, we started building um, Ciclo. I, I think even still today, a lot of people here in Madrid, because Ciclo existed a good two or three years in Mexico City before it came to Madrid. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think a lot of, of my community that I'm connected with here in Madrid realized that I was there from the very beginning. I, we basically built Ciclo. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the main owner, partner, but the CEO and I and his uh, cousin who later left the company shortly after the studio opened. But I arrived in Mexico City in December uh Ciclo didn't open until late June the next year so in that time uh we auditioned many instructors I trained many groups and uh, I thought I would be there for the rest of the year and I would go back to New York I said mm -hmm. this is a great way for me to differentiate myself from the other instructors in New York mm -hmm. I went to Mexico City I helped start this company they off they made me an offer I couldn't refuse <laughs> to stay on and so in uh, October I signed on to stay on for several more years which uh you know I I think in August is when I recognized I didn't know whether this was going to be a success or not it was truly an experiment I mean I look back at now it's sort of the 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 scenario you know the the guys who who created Ciclo came from very well-to-do backgrounds and the longer i got there the more i understood how connected they were to business and the community there so that helped mm -hmm. but i i felt like you know i used all of that experience with music with exercise you know all of the skills that i had acquired at soul cycle to help make ciclo a success and that was and that was you were there for four years you said it uh i was in soul cycle for four years i actually was with with ciclo in Mexico for six years. Ah, you were wow. in Mexico for six years. Six years, yeah. Nice. Uh, How'd you like living in Mexico, aside from the job? Uh, <laughs> I met my wife. Okay, uh, yeah, that's I, good. You go. that. I met my <laughs> wife, uh, which was definitely the highlight. My wife and 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 my entire extended family. I have the best mother-in-law you you could ever ask for. You know, my wife is incredible. Uh, she's she's a badass. She's an incredible instructor. She'll kick my ass, and, and I, that, that's what keeps me so disciplined and in line, my, my wife. Uh, I trained her. She was one of the first uh, trainers that I trained uh, in Ciclo. So she uh, became an instructor very early on. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, that was definitely a highlight. I can't say that I assimilated into the culture in Mexico as easily as I did here in Madrid. Mm -hmm. So just to give you guys a, a timeline, uh, Madrid came in 2018 they decided that no ciclo started expanding very fast mm -hmm. uh and uh they decided they wanted to open up uh, madrid and they sent me here for three months to train the first group of spanish instructors i had about three or four kids that i was training during uh late spring early summer of that year then i went back to mexico but i fell in love with madrid so i was looking and and searching for a way to convince them how can I stay as the master instructor for the company, but live here? Mm -hmm. And so during COVID is when I actually was able to create that scenario. So I moved here in uh, June of 21. And uh, then that's when my story here in Madrid started. Right in and, COVID. Uh, well, we were, we were still wearing the mask. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. for America, they were still, uh, when I say America, you know, the United States, Mexico, mm -hmm. and that part of the world, they were still grappling with COVID pretty good, even by the summer of 21. But I think here in uh, Europe, you guys had, had already come out of the worst mm -hmm. of it. 
And uh, you know, I remember I still have pictures when I moved here, we were still wearing the mask. Yeah. But when I got here, I mean, I was super excited, you know, to, uh, you know, for us Americans living in Europe is, is like yeah, yeah. a dream, you know, <laughs> the land of castles and, and kings. <laughs> and That's a quick story. I, I went somewhere and they said, oh, you went skiing this weekend. I think the king was there. I was like, the king? Like the king of Spain. Oh, I, I was like, when you say to me as an American, the king, I think Elvis, you know? Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to say LeBron. I was like, <laughs> too, too. I was like what? So, um, but yeah, that's how uh, I segue in, in, into Ciclo. And, you know, um, now uh, after working for these two, you know these two big brands mm -hmm. now we uh my wife and i we decided that we wanted to really uh you know take the ultimate risk and now we're creating sessions um which, which we, goes back to music yeah, exactly um well, and, and we want to dig into to sessions uh but and within sessions i'm sure one of the let's say not issues but the word is one of the tasks or one of the challenges that you will have is that as the company grows how do you keep that uh sort of integrity in it. And, and what I mean by that is, for example, when you were at Ciclo, one of your main roles was to to teach uh, new people. Because when I see a company like that, if I am to analyze it and see, okay, Ciclo, great business, but then if we're trying to grow it exponentially, how are we going to do this if by every new center you open, you need to coach, let's say, 10 guys. And it really, it really depends on, I mean, it, the value is in the people that are giving those classes. I mean, the, everything else is just a room Absolutely. with a few bikes and a few speakers. So it's, it's the coach. Itself. It's the coach. Yeah. It's literally the coach. So I was going to say like, how, how is that process and how, how do you, uh, when you were growing Ciclo and obviously now with sessions, you'll have the same, the same, the same issue again, but how do you deal with that and how do you choose the right people? Yeah, it's a very, um, it's an art to growing in a way that will allow you to keep quality control. You know, these types of, of businesses, the, what makes them so successful is expanding and moving into different neighborhoods and different markets. Um, you know, I, I mean, to be quite honest with you, that, that is one of the, the things that I found the most difficult uh, with being with Ciclo is being in a position, you know, I started off sort of in an influential position, mm -hmm. but the bigger the company got, uh, the less I felt uh, influential in order to keep the quality control. You know, there, there, there are a lot of exceptions being made uh, in terms of, you know, it's all relative. You, you see someone and we all can have a different opinion on, is this person going to be successful? Do they have, but for me, everyone needs certain prerequisites mm -hmm. that need to be observed uh, before I can consider them to be able to do uh, what, what it is that we do. I mean, we, I've been doing it for 14 years. It looks like easy. I can make it look easy and, mm -hmm. you know. No, but it's not. I no, mean, it's, it's, it's not. not. And you see the videos on Instagram and everything. You see the guys and you're like, okay, like, this is this is a performance. Yeah. yeah. It literally is a performance that you have to do daily. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how many classes does a, does a coach do, for example, at sessions? And, and let's transition into that and talk about sessions now. Like, how is that going to be structured? Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, is it just going to be you and your wife? Well, we not, not when we open. It's okay. it's just me and my wife now. Okay. Right now, we're teaching uh, at the Four Seasons. Mm -hmm. We are doing a pop up there. We have been collaborating with other uh, you know hotels and brands. So we're going to do that until we open. But the idea is to create a you know a strong team. I want like an all star team yeah. of instructors uh, that have different backgrounds that uh, bring diversity. Uh, we are a Spanish company, even though she's from Mexico, I'm from mm -hmm. the United States. We have this idea of creating a Spanish company. So uh, we want to put an emphasis on searching for Spanish instructors, mm -hmm. but also we want to create a, a brand that will grow throughout Europe. And we see where Madrid is growing with its diversity. Um, we would love to have uh, instructors from other European countries, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, from Italy, from mm -hmm. France, and you know, even maybe another Anglo. Uh, yeah, because I was going to say quite a lot of the at least the current Ciclo instructors are, are South American, right? Uh, yeah. There's not that many Spanish. No. Yeah. No, and uh, you know, I think that we want to create a a company that starts here in in Spain, but will be known for 
to be a European brand. And I how think. does and how does how does this work? Like, how are you attracting this talent? Because obviously, you're opening up opening up sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, say I'm a coach. Um, and I'm one of the good ones. I'm one of the players that you want to bring on your team. Uh, you know, I've got, you know, my solid hundred people or so who come to my classes or, or whatever. And, and I'm deciding, should I take my name and my brand to, to Cicla or should I go to sessions? Like what, what is the differentiating factor? How are you compensating them for, for coming over? The beginning is sessions will not only be the, the bike, mm -hmm. you know, the biking concept, but we're also integrating a functional training hit. So we're going to have two different concepts. But to your point, uh, why would someone want to come uh, join me? I mean, for me, I, if I'm going to sell myself my experience of, you know, having years of training instructors, mm -hmm. uh, training very successful instructors over the years, the, the reputation of, uh, you know, creating success, a successful team, uh, that reputation would be one thing. But uh, also, we are being created and owned by instructors. We're still instructing. We're still instructors. So we understand where you're coming from, from that perspective. We are launching into this entrepreneurial role that we're wearing and working in very, you know, very, uh, we're very busy being mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, but we're still fitness instructors. So we understand, you know, the needs, the needs of an instructor, their fears, you know, how to keep them motivated mm -hmm. in the job. So understanding that I think helps, but also uh, I think what my wife and I are very dedicated to doing is creating a different standard, you know, that I think in time it will be revealed that instructors will want to be a part of that standard. There's a reason why we are collaborating with the Four Seasons right now as we are. I mean, we launched our brand with them. I always said that Boutique Fitness, because of the business model, because of the way it's set up, it should be like the Four Seasons of Fitness. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of like when you walk into the room, someone is greeting you within three seconds. Your every need is attended to. I mean, when you're paying 20, 25 or more euros per class, I think that that requires a certain standard and it's a standard that I'm not seeing, mm -hmm. honestly, being uh, executed in many of the boutique fitness brands. Uh, uh, and that is the, the difference that we want to make. So, and, so like you, you want to level up even more because I've been to Siglo before. I think you have as well. Mm -hmm. And obviously the experience you have, I mean, you get like the cycling shoes, you get your towel, like it's, it's kind of nice. It's expensive, but it's kind of nice. So you want to even level, like level up that even more. Absolutely. So, so you get there and you're like, okay, I'm getting the full ride, not only the training, but also the experience around it. Absolutely. That's yeah. the main goal in terms of. Absolutely. I oh. think that, you know, if you really want to know my opinion, I don't think uh, the market here in, in Spain, uh, or at least in Madrid, has really experienced what uh, the quality should be like. Not, at least not in the, the boutique fitness. You have really awesome uh, gyms. Mm -hmm. uh, like I, I, for instance, I'm a member of uh, Metropolitan. Mm -hmm. and uh, But like the boutique fitness where you specialize in one or two disciplines and, you know, these types of models, I, I think that the standard could be set mm -hmm. uh, so much higher. I think it is yeah. changing. Like there's, a, there's an industry change in general. Uh, I mean, it used to be like the cheapest gym you can go to. That's the one you sign up to. But now people are seeing like, hey, like this is something that we're spending a lot of time doing. Um, let's look for an experience. Let's look for something that actually makes us want to go. And the key here is to get people to keep going. Absolutely. And one of the ways to do it is is definitely definitely by doing that. How does it, how do you, again, going back to the instructors, how, how, how does it, if one instructor is really successful, like is there sort of like, because from what I understand, when you were at Ciclo, your classes were booked in weeks in advance i've been told by my girlfriend i was like going to his classes was like hard it was always it was always packed it was really busy so for you you were a huge asset for Ciclo at the time were you getting compensated in a way or were you were they saying hey you're booking out all the classes you get like a, a commission because you have all the classes booked or something like that or is it everyone's the same well, for me personally it was a, it was wasn't about compensate compensation you know i never had an, an issue really about how i was being compensated but i think for uh, an instructor to keep them motivated. It's a combination of, of course, compensating them mm -hmm. for what they're worth, but also uh, recognizing 
and identifying to the instructor that, and this is a very fine line to walk uh, because you want to, for me, it's my belief that when you create a company, no one individual should be bigger than the icon of the company. Mm -hmm. And that that's always been my belief. You can have lots of different rock stars. And I think that the, the company should work together to make everyone, you're always going to have a few instructors who are more successful than others. That's mm -hmm. just, you know, but it should never be the feeling of any instructors that I'm here or, and it never should be the feeling of any instructor that I'm way up here. Yeah. You know, I think that you, it takes a lot of work to create a team where everybody understands what role they play and be very thoughtful of how you, uh, create a schedule in which everyone can be successful. I mean, you know, for me, uh, during my last, you know, last time at CCLO, you could put me anywhere on the schedule and within a certain amount of time, I could find success. Mm -hmm. Like I knew that, that something was unusual when I was able to sell out 7 a.m. Uh, <laughs> on a Monday morning. You know, that was like <laughs> the, the one time slot no one wanted. And when that sold out for the first time, that was a, a huge sense of accomplishment. But uh, I think that it could happen if you put a certain instructor, you, you sort of evaluate, okay, this demographic is more likely to come at this time. And then, you know, you understand the city, you understand you're going to have your, your expats, you're going to have like your living in this area. And then maybe your, your native Madrilenials live in this area. And you're going to create a team that will gravitate to, to that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, that is very successful for the instructors so that they can be as successful as they, because successful instructors create a successful company. Mm -hmm. And so it should always be working that way. The company should never put certain people on a pedestal and should never try to diminish anyone else. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I, I think that that's the philosophy of, you know, and it starts in the training process when you're looking for instructors. For me, finding a group of instructors that you think, okay, these guys are going to work well together. You have, they seem to, to uh, cooperate great in the training process. And it usually is. People are usually very supportive of each other in the training process. But you want to be thoughtful about it when you're creating your team. You want to be aware of, okay, this person is sort of coming in with the diva mentality. Yeah. They might be talented, but I may have a little bit of problems working with them. Mm -hmm. And then in a certain situation, you say, okay, I can deal with it. Uh, you know, and yeah. then, but maybe you say, no, it's not worth it because you don't want to, in my opinion, infest your team with this negative attitude. Yeah. Too yeah. much effort, like yeah, changing yeah. that mood. I want to dive deep a bit more onto the training itself. So first of all, and let's focus just into the cycling because then you know the uh, the other that session is gonna have that we can talk about it later. But the cycling itself, based on what I've experienced, um, and and here I'm just basing everything on Cyclo. So let's say first question would be: Is sessions going to be the same cycling as Cyclo? So music it'll be it'll and, be very similar. I right. mean, I think. Uh, uh, for me, I think what sessions is, we're very concentrated on uh, having purpose mm -hmm. for every movement. You know, you guys see the videos and there's a lot of choreography and I don't know how you guys <laughs> interpret that and see it. Uh, but, you know, short answer is it'll be very similar. I mean, like Jeremy's class is going to be Jeremy's class that, that you've sort of known. We are going to, from the name sessions, we are going to make it much more diverse in that sense of the music. Mm -hmm. The actual workout will be very similar, but the name sessions is coming out of creating different sessions. So one of the things that I sort of recognized when I got here is that reggaeton was very popular mm -hmm. and most of the instructors were playing the same type of music, saying the same type of things. We want to give a different variety. So you can have a hip hop session. You can have a rock and roll session. You can have an EDM session. It doesn't even have to be tailored to the musical genre, but you can, you can have, you know, like a chill session or, you know, that the name sessions gives us the ability to brand each class in a different way. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I had to certainly make some adjustments that I feel very comfortable in right now. Whenever I started getting more comfortable here in, in Madrid or started teaching here in Madrid, 
so I envisioned that I could do on two or three days a week, I could do back-to-back -back classes and I will brand it Madrid session. That's Jeremy as you've known him here in Madrid. Yeah. Then I'll have a New York session where I'm gonna be maybe a little bit more gritty. I'm gonna put on my my Brooklyn jersey and I'm gonna play a little bit more Biggie and a little bit more- That's me, that's uh, me. Jay-Z. <laughs> I'll be going to that one. And <laughs> I, I feel like one of the, the things is, is I, you know, there was a core uh, group, you know, before that I had to sort of cater to. I had to cater to the girls and with Bad Bunny, with Carol G and with Taylor Swift and I had to, to figure out how to play that. But there, I felt like there was something missing and it was hard to really bring in Kanye yeah. and, and Jay-Z and, yeah. you know, T.I. and Drake and, and that. Sure. And because uh, I felt like if I ever went there, the girls, I would lose the girls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And without a guarantee of getting there's the guys. No, there's no one size fits all uh, yet, right? Yeah, and no. I think we, I think when we were preparing this podcast, perhaps we made the the mistake of thinking, uh, analyzing the training itself, being like, this is perhaps like like we were trying to analyze what the, what an effect the training would have on 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 a person. But I think this is much more of a it's much more of like an experience of, of, of having fun, uh, maybe with some mates or, or going to a, a class that is obviously involves physical activity, but it's not necessarily based on performance. Because when we're thinking about training, we're thinking about <clears throat> some sort of performance benefit. Okay. What I'm thinking here is that, do you see it more as a as a as an experience of, of fun or something that you do? It like, can be both. It I can think, be both? I think one of the things that Sessions wants to accomplish is moving uh, more toward the 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 technical and putting a more emphasis on the technical aspect of it to attract guys like you like you guys who i, I know you guys do the the crossfit and you're really into <laughs> you know working out to. hard yeah. and uh you know sort of my community as it is i wouldn't say that to a large degree that that's necessarily the first thing that that they think about is coming to get a good you know they want a, a good a good sweat and they want to feel like they've gotten a, a good workout but that you know coming in and just like exhausting themselves physically isn't necessarily the top of their list they're coming for the social aspect they're coming to to and be how are you i see i see a clear challenge here for you which is like how are you going to attract guys like us yeah um to go over to your classes mm -hmm. because at, at this time if if my girl is like yo let's go to c club whatever i'm like i'll do it because it's you, but I'm not, but I, I'm not into it. Like we don't choose to go to like, that's so, our challenge. Exactly. Yeah. So how are you thinking? Is it going to be purely music? How perhaps bring it? I mean, it has to start somehow, but it is really interesting that it's mostly girls that are going to this classes. So how, how are you going to, how are you thinking about breaking that? Yeah. It starts with the trainers, with the trainers and, uh, maybe finding one of you guys, mm -hmm. uh, honestly, that to be a trainer. Like I look at you guys and I, I know you bi you're busy here, but my, I come in and I was like, uh, these, these guys, maybe one of them would want to be an instructor, you know? I'll tell you what, I just used to be a CrossFit instructor. Yeah. I was for six years. Yeah. For six years. Huh? <laughs> and uh, we're, we're, we're looking for, uh, <laughs> for uh, functional training instructors, if you would, but it starts there, you know, finding mm -hmm. someone, everyone wants to see a reflection of themselves wherever they go. And I think up until now, you guys have probably never seen anyone who is really giving you a reflection of of what you're looking for so you know now it's not easy to find someone who's willing to 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 consider it who comes from a certain background but uh that it starts there and then you have to make a conscious effort and like when we open for instance just giving you an example uh if i teach my class the way that the community has known it I'm pretty good chance I'm going to start to build a community quicker. Mm -hmm. And then another instructor who's starting out brand new, who's trying to be true to himself, he might be envious of that. And he might start to try to mm -hmm. duplicate so he can be successful and play the same music, say the same things, do the same things. And I want him to stay true to himself because I know if he can stay true to himself, his community will come. Mm -hmm. My community was not built overnight. Mm -hmm. I had to wonder when I got here to Madrid if I had made the right decision in moving here because you know, for the first uh, three months, I had four or five people in my class. I didn't get here with you know the wait list and the, the full mm -hmm. classes. So this is where my experience as, a, as an instructor comes in at as the owner. I can coach and reassure 
and give confidence to a group of instructors, ride the course, stay true to yourself. I'm gonna help you with this. And then it's gonna take maybe six months, but more and more of you guys, if you see a reflection of yourself one by one, ah, I take this class, there aren't that many of us, why don't you come? And then it starts mm -hmm. there, you see? So I'm looking at the long-term goal. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think, I think I can totally relate to that, actually, uh, hearing to you, because um, when I was a, a CrossFit coach, uh, I think I started coaching when I was 19, and uh, everyone else around me was, um, just the profile of the client was, uh, I think, from 30 above. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a bit of the underdog, or just like the like the new joiner, this guy is like at university, uh, working here part-time. Um, he's, he's really strong in terms of performing when doing CrossFit, but I'm not sure if he knows how to teach me to not break my back. Absolutely. <laughs> right? Uh, so literally my classes had two or three people uh, that I actually connected really well with them. Uh, and then I stood there for, I think, five or six years. And I, I'm, not, I'm not saying all my classes were booked, but I can tell you that everyone who was in my class was there because they wanted to be with me. Yeah. Obviously, they wanted to just get a good sweat as well, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so but it's crazy. I mean, when, it you, when, you, when you walk around with, obviously, I've, I've, I've known Iris for, for a while now. When you walk around Madrid with Iris, like the amount of people who they run him? into him like, yo, bro, how are you doing? I'm like, who'd you, how do you know that guy? He's like CrossFit class. He used to come yeah. to my CrossFit class. And it's like, I've never thought about it like that, but you do sort of have a bit of a following of like, people remember the classes that you did as something different or, or something at least that they miss because they always say like, oh. Yeah, but the cool thing is that they, they remember you. They don't remember, I mean, they, they remember the effort that they did with you, but they remember you are at least, I tried to just going off a tangent here, but I tried to get more into the personal side of my session. So of course, uh, you know, like a 35 uh, year old uh, dude that was working like 12 hours a day, they wanted to get a good sweat, get a good lift, whatever, but also, speak with someone, you know, about, you know, life, uh, relationships, uh, travels, whatever, right? Yeah. Holidays, whatever. Uh, so I really got into a good, uh, on a, I mean, maybe on sessions, it's kind of hard because, you know, it's, it's like super fast paced. You're involved uh, in the session itself, but I was just like coaching with them. Sometimes I did uh, walk into mm -hmm. the class and worked out with them, but not, not just a few times. Uh, but I think I, I actually built a relationship. Actually, it's funny enough, uh, you're here because a friend of mine who I met uh, at, at CrossFit. doing CrossFit and we were with him the other day partying because yeah. we're friends. Uh, Absolutely, uh, yeah. He's, he's not a client per se. Uh, but yeah, just coming back to, to the point of, of things take, take time, I think it's, it's important that you can't just build loyalty overnight uh, oh, you have to yeah. stay true to yourself I, I wasn't the most technical one i didn't study anything related with sports uh but I, I i was really good at training crossfit itself so i you have to find yeah your way of coaching your way your way of in my case not being the most technical mm -hmm. but at least being maybe more personal so Absolutely, you know yeah. people just trust you and then it after takes that, different kinds to build yeah. it's a different approach to a single you know which exactly. is having loyalty uh in uh in your classes but uh yeah the, diving deeper a bit on the on the cycling itself on the session for, based on my experience i've been just again three times uh but i feel uh when cycling on on the bike it's kind of unilateral because uh the beat is followed with one leg right mm -hmm. uh if you add i mean i think that's that's kind of uh, hard to follow uh and if you add that up with uh let's say like push-ups on the handlebars or whatever yeah. us being cyclists like pure cyclists where we, we focus on trying to being on the saddle, like, you know, pedaling. Perfect like, symmetry. Yeah, perfect symmetry among the legs and like, you know, uh, pushing evenly uh, and stuff. Mm -hmm. When you add like going up and down, then doing push-ups, then following with one leg, it's it's so hard that that mix. That coordination. Yeah, the coordination uh -huh. that, um, is that actually, um, I don't know, is that, uh, I don't know, could you injure yourself by just leading with your one leg or you, you could injure yourself uh not, not not necessarily with the leading with one leg but you know sort of going back to what i was saying right uh before every movement the way that i train uh, my instructors is that you have to justify every movement so there's this this fine line in staying to the brand girls love, I mean, I used to, like, they love to come in and bounce and do the jogs and see the ponytails bouncing. And <laughs> when the girls can look at themselves in the mirror and they see their ponytails bouncing and you got that good light yeah. going and they look hot and they <laughs> look like, we have to create that euphoria. That's our money maker, yeah. you know? But then, uh, like, we should be switching legs from one song to the, ne to the next okay. so that we're not always leading. And that's something that I have to, you know, uh, remind myself of because it's really easy when you're queuing as an instructor to 
always cue on the, the class's right foot and it's going to be my left foot, mm -hmm. we should switch off so that the body can stay even. And that creates that symmetry that you guys are talking about when you're riding on the, mm -hmm. the, the, the bike on, on the road. So that's one thing. But, uh, I mean, I've watched the industry of, uh, you know, boutique fitness, indoor cycling, we call it rhythmic indoor cycling. So that's mm -hmm. like the difference between a traditional spinning class, as you guys know it. And then what we do with the, 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 the dark room, the lights, that's more of the discotheca, uh, mm -hmm. club atmosphere. Um, I've watched this evolve into something that's super crazy in terms of, you know, I see people throwing their arms and they're shaking and moving. <laughs> and I mean, I used to think when I started, I was pushing the envelope with doing tap back push up combinations at a certain pace. What I'm doing now, what I was doing then is nothing compared to what these guys are doing now. And to your point, yes, you can very easily injure yourself. And so the instructor needs to, and this is where it's very difficult. The instructor needs to take himself out of the performance aspect from time to time and concentrate on communicating with the class. I, one of the basic fundamentals in my training process, I, I, when you create choreography, when you do anything, you need to ask yourself three questions. It's like, am I demonstrating it as the instructor? Am I demonstrating it clearly for the, the class to see? Am I communicating it uh, clearly? And uh, you know, can I do it myself? These, these are things that, that, that the, the instructor needs to, to ask themselves whenever they're asking. Uh, I need to, at any time, if I have 40 people in my class, I need to look out and see that 70% of them are, are doing what I'm doing. Because if I can get to 70%, the class can basically teach itself. The people in the back can learn from the people mm -hmm. in the front. But if I don't have 70% of my class doing any of my choreography, I need to recalibrate. I need to examine how am I communicating it? I need to reevaluate what is it that I'm doing? Is there something, you know, fundamentally wrong with the choreography that I'm doing? But I see in so many instances, younger instructors are so in their own world yeah, <laughs> and they're not opening their eyes. They're not really paying attention to giving uh, that attention. I'm super glad that, that you that you've answered that question in that way because we we've criticized these classes before because we've seen it and the, some of the ones I've been to like the guy is just like sitting there he's spinning the thing he's like one twist to the right and you can see he hasn't even twisted his own thing <laughs> and you're like bro you're, you're like there's no way because I'm like a full on like a, I I train hard I'm a cyclist and if I do the spins that you're telling me to do. I, I wouldn't be able to like, you know, sure. dance and stuff. So there's yeah. no way you're doing that. Exactly. Um, so there's like, I think, as you say, like part of it is a performance and that's all well and good. And, and I, as a moneymaker and people need to feel good. It needs to be good and fun, but the training aspect needs to be focused. And I feel like now I'm really excited about going to the sessions, I have a uh, class and, and, and testing it out. And yeah, I have one more thing regarding the spinning. So for, on the sessions that I've been, um, you, all the class have this work with the same resistance. So they are like two spins to the right, but mm -hmm. how can, like if I, I've gone with my mom, with my girlfriend, whoever, like a lot of people, what's the difference? Like, like how can two people that are- Do the same, yeah. Yeah, do the same resistance. They can't, really. With the same cadence. Yeah. But you know, Chris and I are obviously way stronger than my mom. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. mom, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I mean- Well, first of all, I want to say that, that this form of, of exercise is something that, one of the few things that I think you and your mom can both do and get benefit from in different ways and both enjoy. With that being said, the instructor needs to take the time to elaborate at some point in the, at the beginning of the class. I find myself saying it quite often in the middle. So guys, this is relative. Whenever I'm saying two or three turns, that's relative. You might need a little bit more. If you're a little stronger, you might need more. Most important thing is finding a resistance in which you're challenged and that you can find this beat. Mm -hmm. That's where you need to, to go deeper in. And you need to take the time to get out of just the yelling and the shouting and take a moment yeah. to actually communicate. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, you know, in my ladder before I left is how am I the only English speaker? I'm teaching only in English and I'm communicating clearer to everyone <laughs> 
than any of the other, you <laughs> coaches. know, uh, nice. coaches. I like you have to. You guys should be much better at communicating to what's going on yeah. than than I am. And so I, I that's one of the things that I'm going to emphasize in, in my training process is that you've got to be clear. You know, you, you, it's, it's this give and take. And for me, getting back to the music, the music is the soundtrack that I use as my compass to tell me when I use the music for the crescendos and I'm like, this is a part of the class where I need to perform and give them that euphoria. And I even feel the chill bumps, like I hear the piano, the violins, the percussion or whatever in this place and I need to perform, but the music soundtrack that I've worked and I've thought through my playlist and this part is the music is telling me I need to communicate technique at this place. Mm -hmm. So the music gives you that indication uh, and that's an art, that's a huge part of the training mm -hmm. is using the music to help you teach the class, using the music to help you tell a story. Like we're telling a story musically in that 50 minutes. We're creating an experience in, in that 50 minutes. And some of that needs to be, you know, the technical aspect of it to keep them safe, to make it, you know, efficient, to make it an effective workout. And some of it is just to give them pure dopamine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Adrenaline. <laughs> exactly. exactly. So, do you do the classes in, yourself in terms of resistance and workout? So every time you you get on the bike, do you do you do the workout as well? Or you just go I'm one, pretty one much there. Oh, I'm pretty there? much there with the, I mean, there are times when I, I uh, will get off the bike because uh, I feel like my energy needs to come. Like, for instance, if we do the hill, most of the time I put my hill right in the middle of the playlist. And the mm -hmm. hill is when the palanca is all the way up and we have that resistance, very little dancing. It's a lot of sitting down and coming back up, you know, but we're riding and we're just really, t it, that's the one for the three or the five minutes, however long the hill is, that's where we're really about the resistance. And I know that at that point, I'm not, it's not so consequential that I'm up on the bike giving them a reference for the rhythm. If it's something really fast, I need to stay on the bike to give them the, the reference for the rhythm. Mm -hmm. But for the heel, they need my motivation. So that's when I come down. So th that's one of the moments. And then when, when we do the weights, of course, I, I come off of the bike. But for the most part, I'm up on the bike with them and riding it. Um, you know, uh, with the same amount of resistance and and uh, the same intensity and, and the same energy. That's you know. key. That's key because yeah. because otherwise you're not really feeling what they're feeling and you can't guide them. Awesome. So I mean, I think it's clear that that what you're trying to do with indoor cycling is a, kind of bring it back to its purest form in one where it's uh, it's actually like an honest workout that you're actually getting a good workout and keeping all of the all of the values that, that come with it from the beginning. Um, another another thing that you're doing at sessions, which is different to to any other boutique fitness class, is that you're also introducing um, functional functional mm -hmm. workouts, right? Absolutely. Um, what does that involve? And is that something that you get, let's say you get a pack for sessions and you get five classes and is it three of, uh, three of, uh, I was going to say Ciclo. In Spain, in Spain, you're going to have to fight against <laughs> No, that. I understand. Because yeah, here, Ciclo here, is cycle. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, but yeah uh, how, are you, how, how is that going to work? Well, if you uh, purchase a class or if you purchase a package, you can use your, your credit for either, either one. one. Yeah. So it's the, the same price. So that's, that's easy. Now, uh, my wife is going to be the master trainer for the uh, functional. My wife, uh, Maria Caldoro is her name. She's for the last four years has had her own online training program. She started it right in the middle of COVID where mm -hmm. she still maintains uh, her, her clients, uh, mostly in Mexico but a few here uh, in Spain and in other parts of the world, uh, basically online, and where she's using weights. Now for girls, they would be, you know, five to eight kilos. For guys, maybe 10 to 14 kilos, where, uh, and then also uh, some classes with the kettlebell, where it's uh, 45 to 50 minutes of, uh, you know, hit where you're using your weights on off with your, your body weight, you're, you're incorporating burpees and, you know, like pistol uh, squats and things like that on and off with the weights, really um, high intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of fun. Uh, we're going to use the music uh, in that as well. Sweating, you know, I've, I've done those workouts and, you know, I'll be teaching it as well, but that's going to be her thing in terms mm -hmm. of the training. And, uh, I think it's really going to be a uh, 
cool uh, complement to uh, the indoor cycling. That is that, that going to be in the same space? Yes, it's okay, going to be nice. in the same space. Are, so, we, are we able to say what space is going to be yet, or uh, I don't want to say yet because we haven't we haven't signed as of yet. Okay, uh, but uh, I feel very confident. I, I will say it, it. It will be in Salamanca. Okay, and. Um, all of you point. foreigners love Salamanca. Yeah. <laughs> All of you foreigners. It, 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 everyone's like, ah, Salamanca. Yeah. You know, it, we, it, for me, it's like right in the middle for our two, uh, you know, it, it's like the perfect meeting place. Yeah, yeah, I know. For, I feel for that for sure. No, nah, it's a great place. Yeah. To in terms of, of combining uh, cycling, um, uh, the indoor cycling and the functional fitness, do you have a recommendation for your optimal client to do maybe two each a week or? That's a good, or maybe do... It, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to, uh, you know, get stronger and have more muscle tone, then maybe you do more of the, the hit sessions. Uh, if you're, say that you want to lose weight and you are just starting out and let's say you just want to get moving, maybe uh, starting with the, the cycling because the cycling is a little bit, um, how shall I say, it's a little bit more, uh, beginner friendly mm -hmm. in terms of you can sit in the back and you can, you know, do as much of it, but let's say you're right in the middle and you know, you're starting out and you're pretty acclimated with fitness. What's the, the, the right amount. I would say maybe, uh, three and three, mm -hmm. you know, um, our, our goal is to be a one-stop shop where everything in terms of your, your fitness, we want to uh, incorporate lots of things, uh, workshops and, um, and, uh, we will have a smoothie, uh, and, uh, health bar. So Let's coffee. Go. Let's yes. go. And, That's uh, what I'm in for. Yeah. So, <laughs> and we really want to create a, a social space and our space will, will be large enough to incorporate all of that. We we're uh, it's going to be a 450 meter square, oh, uh, uh, stu uh, space. So, you know, we're going to really make the effort of creating a, a place where you can have a social atmosphere amazing and and who's behind sessions um is it just you and your wife we're the the, the main owner we have investors but we're okay. it's us it's you guys yeah we we created it we uh we worked for for a while we mm -hmm. created the, the 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 name the brand uh we commissioned for the logo I, I really like the logo i don't know if you guys can see but i i came today with uh with a jacket on the back so let's see, see. Yes. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Nice. That's our, our, our name and logo. You should, you should have brought us some merch, man. I, we are working it. on merch. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. I should have brought you guys some t-shirts. We really want to, uh, to invest heavily in, uh, in the merchandise as, as sure. well. I, I, I want to see a brand that, you know, our, our community will be proud to wear and walk down the street and, uh, and be proud to, to represent. Cool, man. Amazing. I think it's about time for the, for the last time of the, yeah. of the interview. We, you know, we've heard some of our podcasts um, and just we didn't tell you this, but to every guest, um, we offer them to give us a, we don't offer them actually, we tell them we to too. give us a, a challenge. A challenge. Uh, and it's a challenge that then Chris and I uh, take on. Uh -huh. um, we've, we've just, as an example, we literally just got back from spending, th there's, a, there's this space in Spain. Well, we have... <laughs> Back to the beginning, we had this guy who's a friend of Addis, who now is a friend of mine as well, called Jimbo. He's a, a crazy, very special dude who's traveled the world, uh, cycling everywhere, very involved in that community. And he's, he's gone across Kazakhstan cycling. And, and he, do, he told us to do a bikepacking trip, like a big one that really challenged us. And we just got back from doing one um, with a couple of mates this weekend where we went, uh, we, we went around an area in Spain called the Spain, uh, uh, empty Spain. They call it the Spanish Lapland because there's nothing. Where is it? It's between Teruel. Okay. And Valencia. Okay. 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 So it's that area that is just empty, beautiful, absolutely stunning, uh, really tough terrain, uh, but there's nothing. You go to a village and from there to the next 70 kilometers, you see nothing. Um, and we just did that and that was a challenge and, and it was amazing. And I feel like we both sort of got to see a bit more of Jimbo, the guy who came over uh, to the podcast and, and now we understand his values a bit more. So is there anything that you would uh, challenge us to do? Ah... Uh. Yeah, I, I want to challenge you guys to uh, come take a class with me. And uh, <laughs> I want to see you on the front row. <laughs> Let's go. I want to see you doing all the choreography. No hiding. Yeah, no hiding. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm going to put you on, on blast. Yeah. And I know you guys can, can do it. Yeah. We I, should definitely do yeah. it. 
I'm uh, so down. Before we leave the, the, the Four Seasons, so we're at the pop-up at the Four Seasons. We, we finish there for the summer on the 10th. Okay. On the 10th, 10th is of July 10th? 10th of July. Okay. Yeah. Oh, 10th so of July. I'm uh, see if I can get you guys there in the next week. We have a little more, or a little over a week okay. uh, to get you guys there. Okay. We'll talk about that. If that Chris yeah. is nervous right now. <laughs> I'm definitely nervous. I'm definitely nervous. But if that doesn't happen because of because of schedule and holidays and stuff like this, um, it will have to be a session. Otherwise, absolutely, it will have yeah. to be a session. Yeah, I mean, uh, we we may come back there. It's still going to be a few months uh, before okay. we open. We may come back to to the Four Seasons in September, but we'll make it happen. That's no, good. we should. Yeah. Let's put a date after this uh, for sure to, to do it, and and we'll report it and see how see it's happening. See how 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 tough uh, Jay exactly. is on uh-huh. the bike. He seems Amazing. too nice here with the mic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. All, All right, right Jeremy. Jeremy. Thanks for coming. Thank Thanks, you guys man. so Thanks. much. It was fun. I Thanks really for making the time. It. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.